the show starts in three, two, one, go. Good morning, Kane Sport. It's September the 14th, 2023. I'm Gary Furman, the publisher of Canesport.com. Joined this morning by our two recruiting writing workhorses, Stephen Wagner and Azubi Charles, as we discuss the news of the day presented today by Caneswear, your headquarters for all your Canes gear and merchandise. If you're going to the game tonight against Bethune Cookman, stop at Caneswear on your way, load up on some new clothes, load up on some tailgating supplies, and um, take advantage of the largest Cane store out there. And um, we'll talk more about that here in a little bit. But uh, First off, today we are going to focus on recruiting because we've we've talked about last week's game. We've talked a little bit about Bethune Cookman. Um, maybe at the end of the show, I'll ask Kazubi. You know, he did a, a story on Bethune Cookman, so he'll be able to tell us a little bit about Bethune Cookman. But I know you guys don't care about that. You care about recruiting, and these two, like if you look at Stephen, you see those you know, bags under his eyes and, you know, Zuby's pretty tired too. And um, there's a reason for that. These guys, since the Texas A&M game, have been absolutely killing it. They have been pounding the phones. They were camped out outside of Hard Rock Stadium on Saturday night as all of those recruits left. And they have literally done probably 35 at least stories in these last few days on some of the key recruits that are considering Miami and uh, hope you guys have enjoyed that. So I thought what we would do first today is just talk a little bit about recruiting and, and, you know, the byproduct of the win against Texas A&M, what it's meaning for the recruiting effort. Uh, Steven, I'll start with you. Uh, you know, you've spoken to so many of these guys and the, the message seems to be very favorable for Miami. Just give us a, a summary in your mind of what beating Texas A&M by a sizable 15-point margin has done to for the Miami recruiting effort. Yeah, this really was a really big win. I know I've said it a couple times uh, already on this show earlier this week, but I think what we're really seeing is this is kind of proof of a culture shift. And to a lot of these recruits, um, this is kind of proof that what Mario Cristobal is doing here is sustainable and that – now that he's going into year two, he has one full recruiting cycle under his belt. They did pretty good in the transfer portal. They made some very significant additions. You know, I'm thinking guys uh, like Matt Lee, A.J. Allen, um, even Tyler Harrell. Uh, they brought in some Francisco Malagoa. Absolutely. Um, they brought in some guys who definitely can play. It looks like they hit on some of these true freshmen that they brought in in the 2023 cycle. And now... Mario Cristobal is kind of able to say, okay, this is my team. This is what I want this thing to look like. Because, you know, last year we had some culture clashes uh, just in terms of, you know, what Manny Diaz kind of envisioned for his team and some of the values that he had on his coaching staff and maybe some of the different, um, maybe some of the different uh, values that he wanted in kids that he recruited. And then Mario comes in. And he basically says, you know, hey, you remember what Manny Diaz was doing? Well, frankly, there's a reason why uh, coaching changes happen. And I think we maybe saw like a little bit of a, you know, a little bit of a culture conflicting uh, right there. There was there was I think that's definitely fair to say. Um, but now that he's in year two, he has his guys. Um, they really revamped the roster in the offseason. And I think a lot of recruits are seeing that. I think it is really clear to a lot of recruits that even though Miami is young, that's very clear. Um, and Cristobal only has one full recruiting cycle under his belt. It's very, it's very apparent that Cristobal is making his imprint on the program, that this program is starting to look and kind of feel a little bit like a Mario Cristobal team. And whenever most players think of Mario Cristobal, the first thing they think of is him winning the Rose Bowl at Oregon, him winning multiple Pac-12 conference championships. They don't instinctively think of, oh man, you know, that team got hammered at home by Middle Tennessee. No, I mean, like this is- this, <laughs> Thank like, God. <laughs> Thank it's, God it's, they don't think that way. It's proven human instinct to remember the good and kind of forget the bad. And so for a lot of these kids, you're naturally thinking about, you know, a 2020 uh, Oregon team 
that where their season, you know, kind of was a little bit all over the place. And then in the last week of the season, they go to USC and beat the Trojans and win the Pac-12 or Justin Herbert uh, being a first round draft pick. Kayvon Thibodeau going uh, going in the top 10. Mario Cristobal winning the Rose Bowl, uh, being just a few bad snaps away from a college football playoff multiple years. There is real belief that Mario Cristobal can coach and that this program is starting to look like what a lot of these recruits expected. And I think, quite frankly, what a lot of Hurricane fans expected whenever Mario was first brought in. Azubi, uh same with you, man. You've like been uh, talking to a lot of these guys. What 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 impressions have you been walking away with? Yeah, no, I'm probably gonna sound like a broken record, but these kids are, you know, saying all the same things. You know, it's kind of coming true what they've been telling me the past year and a half, and that's something that you love to hear. I mean, Steve and I probably love hearing this too. You know, you hear Miami preach to these kids. You know, for the last six, seven months, hey, we're building, we're building. Just come give us a chance. Come check us out this year and, you know, see see how you like it and see how it is. And Miami's kind of putting it all on the field and showing these guys, hey, we weren't lying about, you know, what's going to happen and what's going to happen once we get to our guys, once we build the culture that we want and all that good stuff. So from a kind of general standpoint, looking at the bigger picture, it seems like every one of those recruits walked out of, you know, Hard Rock Stadium with a better impression of Miami thinking, hey, these guys are telling the truth. You know, what else can they do? I want to see what they do for the rest of the season. That's another kind of thing that I got from a few guys, you know, obviously this is a big bin, but can they keep this momentum up? Can they keep winning? Can they keep, you know, bringing in these top guys and bringing in these top performances? So uh, I've said it a thousand times. I'll say it a thousand more. If Miami keeps winning, this recruiting is going to get a whole lot easier for Mario Cristobal. It'll have a whole different look in December. Uh, mm-hmm. A lot of those guys that have gone in other directions will be reconsidering um, the hurricanes for sure. Uh, so Azubi, I'll stay with you since uh we were just talking, you were just talking, um, any individuals in the last week that have kind of stood out to you that you're saying that, you know, that one's starting to turn, you know, that could become a commitment at some point soon, anything like that. So two, two, you know, off the top of my head, I think of a 2025 guy starting with Armando Blunt. Um, he was a guy that backyard kid, Miami central, always loved Miami, always kind of told me from talking to them, hey, Miami is a team that I always loved. They show me a lot of love. But with him seeing, you know, them dominate in person, that was huge for him. And he he left on that golf course after the game, just all smiles from ear to ear, happy. And then two days later, he releases his top five, and, and Miami's in it front and center with, with those other four schools. So I'm not saying that game had, you know, the direct impact of him saying, you know, Miami's in my top five. But Miami definitely has his attention right now. And, you know, another 2025 five-star guy's name, Oford, made his, you know, way down from Alabama for to Miami for the first time this for the first time ever. And he really, really enjoyed it. You know, obviously he's kind of a quiet guy, so he wasn't, you know, quick to say, you know, Miami is a front runner, but you know, he's saying he really likes what he saw. And obviously with conversations with Coach Cristobal, Coach Jamil Adai and all those guys, he's loving what he's hearing from Miami and they're backing it up on the field from what they're saying, you know, before the game and in the locker room and over the phone. So if I say, you know, the needle move the most, I would say those two 2025 five stars, which is huge. You know, obviously, we, we love to hear about the current class, the 2024 guys. But, hey, come December, come January, these 2024 kids are a thought of the past. You're, you're focused on these 25 guys. So establishing those connections and playing those roots earlier are huge. And I think Miami's done a great job with those two top 10 2025 kids. Steven, who's jumping out to you? Ooh, that's definitely a that, that's definitely a rough question because my answer was definitely going to be Armando Blunt. Uh, that that was that was definitely the guy um, who I was going to go to. But it was um, a copycat game, Stephen. No, no worries. <laughs> yeah, I, I I really was going to say Armando Blunt because uh, and we actually wrote about this the other week. Um, right now, it's kind of a Florida State Miami recruiting battle for him. Yes, there are three other programs in his top five. But right now, this is really a two-way fight. I, it, My interpretation is this is really a two-way fight uh, between Florida State and Miami. And frankly, Florida State's a little bit ahead at the moment. And so how does Miami counterpunch that? They go out and they win. That's like that really is the simplest that really is the simplest recipe um, for getting guys like these five like five, or for getting five star recruits like Armando Blunt is just going out and winning. Um, Armando got out, uh, got out to Texas. I'm getting ahead of myself here. Armando got out to Orlando for Florida State season opener against LSU. 
um, the uh, the first week of the season. And he really, really liked what he saw in the sense that Florida State played very, very well. And their defense, although it wasn't perfect for a lot of the night, it made real stops whenever it had to. And Armando was really, really impressed by that. He was impressed by the intensity, the energy, the atmosphere. Well, you know how you get that intensity, that energy, that atmosphere. If you're Miami, you win. If you win a lot, that energy, that intensity, that atmosphere is naturally going to come. All of a sudden, if Miami is the higher ranked team whenever Clemson rolls into town, if Miami happens to be favored in that game, if Miami starts out 5-0, and and heck, even if they go to North Carolina and they knock off a Heisman contender and who's likely going to be a top five draft pick in Drake May, all of a sudden that energy, that intensity that he's feeling at Florida State, that happens at Miami too. Texas A&M was definitely a step in the right direction there. Um, but I really felt like, uh, but I really felt like if this continues, I think that decision starts to get a little bit easier for Armando Blunt because he's made it very, very clear. He does not have a problem staying home in Miami, being in South Florida and playing football with a bunch of guys who he grew up with, uh, knows from school, knows from the South Florida football scene. And if he walks into a locker room where he naturally already knows half of the guys there, it's kind of got that homey feeling. That's something that he is very, very open to. And I do think that Miami's in a much better place with Armando uh, after this game. And we're already seeing these local guys starting to tweet at each other, you know, trying to recruit each other. And uh, you get the sense that this, hey, a South Florida top player has got to stay home together and make this thing happen. We can do it. And it was proof in the pudding. We, you know, we played a Texas A&M team that had four and five stars from all over the country uh, the other day, and we beat them soundly um, with a lot of guys from South Florida. You know, so the key play, you know, Jacoby George is from South Florida. Xavier Restrepo is from the whole, is from the whole secondary is from South Florida, too. I mean, Everywhere. It's from South Florida. Uh, South Florida is standing up and being counted right now on this Miami Hurricanes football team. And it's an opportunity for them to emphasize that and continue to build on it. Uh, so, yeah, these kids are taking it on themselves. They're trying to make this their team, their program. They're recruiting each other. And that's when you see something special starting to happen. And hopefully we will look back on this day, this week, and say this is when Miami really turned the corner and things started to turn back in the right direction. And now look at this Miami program now. So, um, you know, we'll see what happens there. Um, a guy I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, right now, guys, is Aiden Breland. We have a story on the website. Uh, he has narrowed down his list to three, Miami, Georgia, and Oregon. And he is a five-star defensive lineman from Santa Ana, California from uh, the great uh, made or die high school. And um, that's huge for Miami to be in the final three. And you listen to what he was saying and you get the sense that Miami is firmly there. Um, does he stay on the West coast and go to Oregon? Um, does he go to the front runner in Georgia or does he come to Miami to be coached by Jason Taylor, Joe Salavea and um, be part of a program that's on the rise. And uh this is going to be an interesting uh, decision, Stephen. Um, you know, give us your thoughts on uh, Aiden Breland. Yeah, so the way that I see it, this is really going to come down to the question of how much does Aiden Breland believe in Mario Cristobal, Jason Taylor, and Joe Salavea? Even though right now at Miami specifically, and I want to emphasize at Miami, kind of forgetting what they did at Oregon for for a moment, um, you know they haven't had, uh, you know they they haven't developed what I would call you know a truly elite uh, defensive lineman just in the year and a half or so um, that they've been at Miami. Now, um, of course, you know you look at Georgia's resume and the way that they've turned out. Uh, defensive lineman over the last couple of years. You look at some of the studs that Oregon has had, albeit those were guys that Mario Cristobal had and guys that Dan Lanning inherited um, at Oregon. This really comes down to how much does Aiden Breland trust uh, Miami's coaching staff to develop him? Because he said straight up, NIL is not going to be the be-all end-all for him. Um, he, he 
acknowledged that, you know, it may be more important to some recruits and he respects the recruits that, uh, that it is a little bit more important to, but for him, NIL is not going to be the ultimate reason why he chooses to commit to a school. For him, it's all about development because he understands, you know, NIL money is nice, but the real money is in the NFL. It's in that guaranteed contract that a first round draft pick gets. Um, you know, NIL money is a fraction of what a top 10 draft pick gets whenever you get 20 something million dollars guaranteed. Oh, um, and let's be honest, he's a five star defensive lineman. Whether he goes to Miami, Georgia, or Oregon, Stephen, he's getting his NIL money. Oh, absolutely, absolutely, yeah. and I think he definitely, absolutely um, understands that too. I mean, I'm not going to speak for him, but I mean, you know, who's to who's to say that he knows he's going to get his bag uh, either way? And so that's not really something that he's um, that he's overly concerned about. I mean, right now he is the highest remaining uncommitted defensive lineman in the 2024 class. Uh, I believe he's the only remaining five-star uncommitted defensive lineman um, in the 2024 class, but he has a lot of belief in Oregon's ability to develop and in Georgia's ability to develop. And so the way that I see it, this is ultimately going to come down to, are you willing to trust Mario Cristobal, Jason Taylor, Joe Salavea more than you trust, say, a Kirby Smart? Um, who's just won back-to-back -back national championships and is rolling right along. His recruiting machine is chugging along. George has got another loaded roster. Um, or are you going to believe in Mario Cristobal, the guy who offered you whenever you were at, whenever you were in seventh grade, whenever you were 12 years old, and was really, really high on you the entire time that he was in Oregon, uh, that the entire time that he was at Oregon and has remained high on you ever since he got to Coral Gables and has recruited you like that ever since he got to Coral Gables. Um, that's really going to be, I think, what this recruitment is going to boil down to. Um, now, he said uh, he told on threes Chad Simmons uh, that right now the race definitely is very tight and that's the impression that i have been getting um as well if i was a betting man um earlier this summer it really felt like oregon was the team to beat now i think georgia really feels like like a definite contender but miami has been there through everything miami has never left his radar miami has always held firm they've always been steady they made a really good impression on him on his official visit and they haven't stopped recruiting him with that intensity that quite frankly is needed to land a guy like aiden breland um now his commitment could be coming soon. His commitment could be coming right after the season ends. Um, he didn't give a specific date. Um, but one thing's for sure, um, if there was ever a time for that all hands on deck, no holds barred recruiting push, it is now. Now is the time to throw the absolute kitchen sink at Aiden Breland. If there's anything you can think of that can give you that boost within NCAA regulations, not advocating to commit any recruiting violations. You don't um, have to cheat anymore. You have NIL. That's, that's an excellent point. Um, now might uh, now might be the time to really throw that kitchen sink. Yeah, I feel pretty confident, you know, that this one will not be decided by, by NIL money. I think all three final contenders will have plenty of that for Aiden Breland. I mean, Oregon, you know, of course, it has a plenty full budget. Um, Miami and Georgia do too. So uh, it's going to come down to where he wants to go to school. And um, he doesn't have to worry about NIL because it's going to be there no matter what. So check that story out on the website today. All right, I'm going to ask these guys about some other recruits, and we'll talk about some a few more of the stories that are on the website. But let me take a moment here right now to talk about uh, Canesware, which has moved into an exciting new bigger, brighter store uh, down the sh shopping center from where they were in the past. They're now at 2655 South University Drive in Davie and with football season in full swing. Um, Canesware is where you will find the largest selection of Miami Hurricanes merchandise absolutely anywhere. Um, you want to be all decked out. They've got T-shirts, jerseys, polos, hoodies, hats, flags, decals, magnets. Uh, want to go tailgating tonight before the Bethune-Cookman game? 
You need you need a new tent. You need some chairs. Uh, Azubi, you'll be you going to be out there. Of course, <laughs> so, I'll be enjoying you're, it. You're, you're going to be working, young man. I know that. Um, <laughs> but uh, no, you want like some new stuff for your tailgate uh, t tonight. Uh, you can go by Canesborough. They've got tables. They've got chairs for you uh, to fulfill all your tailgating needs. They're actually next door. And you, you know, if you don't feel like cooking, you, you had to, you, you know, you have to work uh, tonight and you're just not going to have time to do the whole normal tailgating thing. They're actually right next door. And this is actually a lure for them because the best sub shop in South Florida is a place called La Spada's. And it's right next door to Canesware. So you can go buy yourself some new Canes merchandise, get yourself a sub for your tailgate at La Spada, all in one stop there at 2655 South University Drive in Davie. Um, they even have Dolphins gear, inner Miami, messy stuff. Um, Panther season's coming up real soon. So this is a great time to go buy Canesware and get stocked up. Uh, it's an experience. And then in that expanded location, you will find the greatest selection of Miami Hurricanes gear anywhere around. So it's 2655 South University Drive in Davie. If you can't get to the store, um, they're open 24 hours a day at canesware.com. So 2655 South University Drive in Davie or canesware.com for all your Miami Hurricanes merchandise need. All right, guys, a um, lot of recruiting stories on the website uh, this morning. I'm going to just t touch on on a, on a few of them. Um, we've got a story on Jacksonville Reigns, four-star offensive lineman Solomon Thomas. He's the number 22 pros overall prospect in the 2025 cycle. He has visited Miami twice in two months. Uh, right now he's a four-star, but uh, don't be surprised if this isn't the guy that rises up to be a five-star before that 2025 cycle kicks in, um, in into overdrive. Um, so you can read what, what he's saying about, uh, Miami, uh, Chicago Kenwood Academy, four-star edge commitment, Marquise Lightfoot, a very important recruit in this class. He came to town, uh, on Saturday and he weighs in, um, also spoke to American heritage, four-star 2025 running back Byron Lewis. That story is on the website. Um, Savannah, uh, Christian prep, four-star 2025 tight end Logan Brooking, uh, he, uh, he came to town for the, the Texas A&M game last week. Um, Miami's got a lot of competition for that one, man. A lot of big time schools are recruiting Logan Brooking. You can read about that. Uh, we've got a story on Jeremiah Marcelin and Ezekiel Marcelin, um, two South Florida prospects. Uh, Jeremiah is a 2024 linebacker from Miami, New Orleans. Uh, Ezekiel is a 2025 linebacker from Miami Central. Are those guys? Do, is there any kind of distant relation there between the two Marcelin guys? There is. A, there is a very distant relationship, and neither of them is sure what it is. I know because I asked. <laughs> so they think they're related, and they have no clue how. They think they're somehow related, way far down the line. They don't know who's related to who, but somewhere in there, they think they might be related. Oh, that is that that is absolutely awesome. But uh, both are very highly regarded prospects with very impressive offer lists. Check out those stories. Um, like I said, these guys have been working, man. We got a story on Lake Mary, 2026 quarterback, Noah Grubbs. Um, Kasimi Osceola, four-star linebacker, Elijah Melendez. His recruiting stock is skyrocketing after he recently got a handful of Power 5 offers, including one from Mario Cristobal and the Canes. Um, Miami Palmetto, 2025 defensive tackle, Davion Dixon. He's been shooting up Miami's radar. We got a story on him. Another uh, linebacker from Vero Beach, uh, Tarvis Alford. Um, he's been one of the Miami Hurricanes' top targets in the 2025 class. We've got a story on him as well. You can catch up on that one. Uh, another 2025 offensive lineman, Zaire Addison. Um, he was in Miami's recruiting section last weekend. It just goes on and on and on and on. And guys, uh, one thing I'm seeing as uh, I absorb all this fantastic work you've been doing is there's a lot of focus going into 2025. Uh, you know, the 2024 class has I think, 21 commitments right now. 21 and 22. 22. 22, yeah. Uh, so it's up to 22. So there is not a lot of work left to be done in 2024 if they hold on to what they've got. Uh, now, they'll 
you know, though I'm sure they'll, <laughs> there, there will still be some action in the next few months, no doubt about it. But what we're seeing is a lot of focus on 2025. Uh, Stephen, uh, you know, talk a little bit about that. Uh, obviously, it's never suit, never too soon to get ahead in recruiting. Yeah, so I think right now um, what we're seeing is Miami basically saying, hey, we do feel pretty good that the guys who are committed to us right now, we feel very good that we are ultimately going to end up signing these guys um, in December. Now, of course, Miami is going to make their pushes for some top recruits in December. Other programs are going to make some pushes for Miami recruits in December. Like I can, I can absolutely guarantee you that what Miami is going to try to do to some other programs, some other programs are going to try to do to Miami. That's the, that's the recruiting world that we live in. Um, So there's definitely going to, there is definitely going to be um, some December pushes from a lot of angles, but I think more generally um, what Miami's kind of saying here is they're confident that they are going to sign these dudes. Um, They're confident that, JoJo Trader, that Zaquan Patterson, that Artevius Jones, um, even though there's obviously other schools that are still after them, other schools that still want them, they're thinking, yeah, we do feel good about the position we're in. We do think these guys really do want to be Hurricanes. We think they ultimately are going to be Hurricanes. And not to mention, um, you know, like you said, Gary, they have 22 commits uh, on this or on on their list for the 2024 class and um while there definitely still are uh some guys that they really do want to add and some guys they will make they absolutely would make room for uh no matter what you know i'm thinking like a david stone i'm thinking an lj mccray i'm thinking an aiden breland um a jeremiah smith you know one of these really top elite uh high four star or five star prospects um i think that Miami saying, yeah, it is okay to go ahead and at least peak at the 2025 class. Um, because I think one thing that kind of hampered Miami in the 2024 cycle um, was they were so wrapped up in 2023 that they didn't get a tremendous jump on 2024 in those first couple of months. Um, and, you know, it used to be, and I remember. Um, talking to some to, uh, to some folks who uh, who work in college football about this, it used to be if you didn't have a single commit by the end of May, there was absolutely nothing to worry about. If you got six of your, if you got six plus commitments, if you got ten plus commitments in October or November or December, you were feeling pretty good. You weren't overly concerned, um, but now. I think I think a little bit of panic starts to set in um, with a lot of fan bases whenever you go through the first couple of months and you see that some of these, uh, you know, really top tier programs like Georgia, Ohio State, Alabama, you know, they've got 10 commits by the end of March. And if you're a Miami fan, you sit there, you know, you're looking at your uh, your commit list and you're going, well, man, right now we have a kicker and you start to get. Um, a little bit anxious. And I think that that's maybe something that Miami wants to avoid this year. I think Miami does want to get the commit ball rolling a little bit earlier this year than maybe they have um, in uh, in years past, or at least uh, at least earlier than maybe Mario Cristobal has in years past. I think Miami definitely would like to get some of these commits rolling in in January and February and March uh, of 2024 um once uh once we finally get around there so that you know maybe they can be a little bit better short up on the 2025 cycle um because right now i think what we're seeing from miami is them saying hey you know we're in a position where we kind of do have to make uh where we kind of do have to make that late push because they didn't land a ton of early commitments um you know they they really did feel good about the positions that they were in heading into their june official visits And um, while they definitely did land some prospects that were very, very high on their list and some prospects that that staff is really, really excited about. I mean, they also missed on guys like uh, Justin Scott. They missed on guys like Kamari and Franklin. Um, They missed on Jeremiah Smith. Jeremiah Smith committed to Ohio State back in December of 2022. Um, I think that that's and that's obviously something that Miami is still trying to uh, is still trying to fix. That's definitely a guy 
that Miami obviously um, doesn't want to miss out on. But I think Miami's thinking to themselves, hey, man, if we can get a good jump on this 2025 class, if we, if we can get these early commits rolling in, we're never going to say no to early momentum right after signing day. All right, Azubi, uh, it, it's that moment. Uh, you're probably the only one in South Florida that knows absolutely anything about Bethune-Cookman, the opponent for tonight's game. Uh, give us a quick synopsis on what the Hurricanes will be facing tonight at Hard Rock Stadium. So uh, Bethune-Cookman, this game, when the schedule was first released, it was kind of the uh, Ed Reed return to Miami and all that good stuff. But oh, that's right. After kind of things you know, didn't work out with them, they went in a different direction and you know, they picked up a win this year, I believe, versus Savannah State in their second game of the year. But, you know, their first game, they lost to Memphis 56-14. to 14. And, I mean, it's 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 uh, it's kind of what you expect, a kind of a tune-up, I wouldn't say a tune-up game for Miami, but one of those games where you get a lot of players in, you hope to, you know, leave injury free. I'm not trying to disrespect bethune Cook in any way. I know Mario made that, you know, kind of known that we're going in this game full head of steam. And I think, you know, Miami needs to do that coming off a of Texas A&M win like that and kind of not let their foot off the pedal. You know, don't be complacent. Don't come in and think you're going to beat these guys by 60, which you should. But just just play your game, have fun, dominate early, put it away, let your young guys get some burn. And kind of that's the biggest thing. But doing Cookman's, um, they don't ha- have too many guys that are, you know, world leaders, but they do have some athletes on their team like every, you know, Division one football team. I'm not saying these guys are going to be, you know, a complete walk in the park, but Miami should handle these guys fairly well. And there's not, you know, if you look at their starting quarterback, you know, 244 yards, two touchdowns, two games, you know, nothing mind blowing. Their leading running back has 78 yards in two games. So it's not too much to worry about offensively and defensively. I feel like Miami, you know, should ha- handle them pretty, you know, decently. Kind of my keys for this game, if there were any, just clean up the special teams, use this to find your guys back there, get the young guys some burn and kind of figure out that situation in the secondary with Cam Kitchen, see what works, see what doesn't, kind of test out the waters with that moving forward to Temple and Georgia Tech. So uh, big game tonight for Bethune-Cookman fans to, you know, come out and enjoy it. I know it's not, you know, your Clemson headliner or your, your Texas A&M headliner, but a lot of good stuff could still happen in this game and will happen in this game. So that's kind of my little rant on Bethune-Cookman versus Miami tonight. <laughs> I just want to know who the first quarterback off the bench is going to be for Miami. You know, do they give it to, do they give it to Jakari this time because Emory played against Miami of Ohio, or do they let them both play this week? You know, it, it, it'll be interesting to see what happens there. To me, that's the most interesting thing. I mean, a lot of, and I want to see Ray. I want to see Ray Ray. I want to see Ray Ray get involved this week. That would be nice yeah. to see as well. And uh, people want to see a little more of Burchard Smith after that kickoff return. Uh, I would think this is the week that we'll start to see more guys in- involved. There's no reason to, uh, you know, have the starters play more than they have to in this game. So we'll see. Hopefully it goes well. They build a big lead early and they get a lot of guys playing time. All right. So that's going to do it for this morning for Good Morning Cane Sport. We thank you so much for starting out your day with us. If you like this show, like our channel, hit your subscribe button, hit your like button. It helps us with the algorithms at YouTube and growing our audience. And More than anything, if you are not yet a subscriber to canesport.com, please, please, please come on over, uh, join the club, so to speak, become part of our fan community. Your subscriptions are what allow us to do what we do for you every single day. So for Stephen Wagner and Azubi Charles, I'm Gary Furman. Thanks again, everybody. We will see you at the stadium tonight. And on this show, we'll see you next time. Goodbye, everybody.